Hello everyone. In this series of lessons, you will be learning all about this super fascinating study conducted by Holzl and her colleagues, which is all about the benefits of practicing something called mindfulness. Maybe you can start with a little mindfulness. Close your eyes, take a deep breath, hold it and exhale. What I just did is not exactly mindfulness, but it's part of mindfulness. And in this series of lessons, you won't just learn more about what mindfulness is, but you will find evidence, thanks to this incredible research study, of how mindfulness causes physical changes in the structure of our very brain itself. And through those changes, we experience an elevated state of well-being and we feel better and we perform better as well. Let's begin with a very quick introduction to the study and in this particular lesson you learn about a quick overview of the study so you can describe it very quickly and I will introduce you to some of the key terms in this study which are very biological, a little technical, but don't worry, by the end of this lesson you'll know how to describe the most important structures of the brain that Hulzel and her colleagues were looking at in this research study. So. The first thing you obviously might already know is that the study resides in the biological approach. Now, you'll remember that the biological approach carries its own two assumptions. And the first of those assumptions is that all of our thinking, our feeling, our behaviors are coming from our genetics, our hormones, and our physiological makeup, which is through evolution. Our biological systems have evolved over thousands and thousands of years to make us survive and make us able to adapt to our surroundings. That's the first assumption. And hence, biology is responsible for our behaviors and our thoughts and our feelings. The second assumption of the biological approach is that all individual differences meaning all differences between us in the ways in which we express ourselves or behave can be put down to the interaction between our biology and individual factors, such as our environments. So, in line with this, Hulzel and her colleagues were looking at the brain. Now, you already know the brain is the most incredible, most powerful organ in the human body. And it is your brain which tells the rest of your body how to communicate with everything else in your body. For example, if I can raise my hand, it's because my brain is communicating that signal to raise my hand while my brain is also forming the words that I'm speaking at this very time and also thinking about what I'm going to say. And you, on the other hand, while you're sitting there listening, watching, you're also processing all of this information that you're seeing and you're hearing and all of that is coming from this incredible organ called the brain. Now, what Holzel and her colleagues wanted to do was they wanted to see how by using this thing called mindfulness, which is a technique of becoming more and more aware of how one feels, how one is experiencing one's surroundings or whatever is around one, and also, of course, through breathing, like I just mentioned in the introduction. So it is how you can train yourself to not just become much more aware of your in-the-moment surroundings and experiences, but they wanted to see how that practice of mindfulness, of becoming more aware in the moment, can lead to changes in brain regions themselves. So they were looking specifically at gray matter in the brain. And if you look at this diagram here, you can see gray matter in the brain is essentially the actual structures in the brain. Whereas white matter that you can see here, white matter is also part of the brain, but white matter is a part of the brain that communicates between all the gray matter structures. And if you ever study neuroscience, then this will be the focus of your study, but for Hulzel and her colleagues, they wanted to see how brain regions or specific regions in the brain, and they looked at three specific areas and how they changed in their shape, in their volume through extended mindfulness practice over an eight week period. 
This study is very interesting. It builds on an existing body of research in the field, which again shows how different parts of the brain have increased in size and volume and become more active as a result of mindfulness practice. And so for Halzel and her colleagues, this was very much an exploratory study that was meant to build on that existing re research. So what they did was they had 33 adults participate in their study. And of those 33, they had 16 who were in the experimental group. And that group under something called MBSR, which you'll become much more familiar with. But essentially, what they did was called mindfulness-based stress reduction. So with this mindfulness-based stress reduction course that the participants took, Holzel and her colleagues were able to, sorry, this is stress reduction. So through MBSR training, Holzel and her colleagues used an MRI for something called voxel-based morphometry. Morphometry is essentially measurement. And when we're talking about morphometry in the context of our study, we're talking about measuring the size of different regions or different areas in the brain. Now, previous research, as I mentioned, had shown that there were shifts in brain structures based uh, on the amount of mindfulness or the practice of mindfulness being built into people's lives. And in fact, they also showed that mindfulness causes a reduction in symptoms of anxiety, of depression, of chronic pain, of substance abuse, and so on. So clearly, there are many benefits to mindfulness. And through this, through this kind of research, that Halzel and her colleagues were doing, situated in the biological approach, they're using something called an MRI, which is a magnetic resonance imaging machine, to implement what is called voxel-based morphometry, which is a volume-based measurement of different regions of the brain. And they combined that with a questionnaire that was meant to assess people's knowledge of mindfulness practice. And using these measurements, they basically determined how from the beginning or prior to that eight-week MBSR course, and by the end of that MBSR course, how people's brain structures had shifted, if they had shifted at all, and if they their performance in mindfulness, their understanding in mindfulness had any change. And that's what the questionnaire was for. So this is very interesting experimental study, but it's not a pure experiment because it is an exploratory study. And we'll talk about this in a later lesson on the aims and the hypothesis of this study. But while it is designed as an experiment, it also had an associated correlation and that means when x increases, is there a change in y? Or when x decreases, is there a change in y? So they were looking at when mindfulness practice time increases, is there a change in brain structure or knowledge of mindfulness through time spent practicing mindfulness? But this was a longitudinal design, and longitudinal design and research is always used when we're talking about a study that goes on for an extended period of time. Now, remember, the MBSR course that I was just talking about was, was an eight-week course. And the entire study took about, I would say, about 10 to 12 weeks to complete. Hence, it qualifies as a longitudinal design study. So let's now look at some of these complicated terms that I've been using. So first of all, what is mindfulness? Mindfulness, mindfulness is a stress reduction technique. And it uses deep breathing. And the focus is to bring your own self-awareness into the present moment that you're currently experiencing and to experience the present moment without judgment. So with a non-judgmental attitude, mindfulness-based stress -based, mindfulness -based stress reduction or MBSR in this study was a course that was teaching mindfulness practice by creating daily habits in individuals. And the course did this in, there were three fundamentals that were used in this course and they used, they used mindful yoga which is stretching uh, in yoga poses, but paying attention to the movements. They used sitting meditation, which is literally when you're sitting and you close your eyes and you breathe in deep and you try and focus on your breath and you know how you're feeling. And they also used, they also used something called a body scan. A body scan is when you lie down and you 
pay attention to how different parts of your body feel. And you literally can start from the top of your head or you can start from your toes and move upward just to see how your body is feeling. So as you can tell, mindfulness-based stress reduction or mindfulness itself, both of these are very much focused on the bodily experience that you have, how your body actually feels. Now, magnetic resonance imaging or MRIs, you must have heard this in any sort of medical setting. So once was having an MRI scan, an MRI is a way to literally see inside the body. And by it doesn't just see inside the body, it captures images of what different organs inside us look like. And hence for this particular study, MRIs were very useful because they provided images of the structures of the brain. Now, functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRIs are a little bit different because they also capture images, but the purpose of these images is to determine brain activity. And through this activity, these fMRIs are used to see what functions are being performed in what areas of the brain. So for example, you may be hooked up to an fMRI machine and asked to recite something out loud. When you're reciting something out loud, the fMRI will capture what areas of your brain are most active. And that then tells the scientist, the researcher, or the doctor, which area of your brain is responsible for the function of speech. Then you have gray matter, as I had just shown you in that little diagram earlier. Gray matter are the structures of your brain and they are where all the work literally happens, whereas white matter is where communication is passed on between different structures of the brain. Voxel-based morphometry or VBM, as we're going to call it, is used to determine the volume of different structures and it is very useful because it generates quantitative data and you know that quantitative or numerical data is very helpful when we are trying to remain objective or free of personal opinion and this study makes extensive use of VBM. Now let's talk a little bit about the brain itself because remember this is a biological approach study and it is very much focused on human biology. Now first of all Neuroplasticity, so neuro will always refer to the brain. And plasticity, you can remember if you've ever used plasticine or Play-Doh, you can always shape it into different forms, right? It, you can literally stretch it, you can make a little ball out of it, so on, so on, whatever. So you can change the shape of Play-Doh or plasticine. Just remember, neuroplasticity talks about how the brain is able to reshape and reorganize. And this happens through building new neural connections, which is called synaptogenesis. Genesis means the creation of something new. Synapse is something that is part of your brain, which connects different neural cells in your brain. So neuroplasticity is a really revolutionary discovery because what it tells us is that the human brain is constantly able to change and shift based on what is happening around it. And so, for instance, fascinating fact, but after your age 25, you will need to make a conscious effort to maintain neuroplasticity in your brain. Otherwise, what you will experience is the opposite of synaptogenesis. And instead of forming new neural connections, you will have reduced neural connections. But neuroplasticity refers to how the brain changes whenever new neural connections are formed. This is obviously important for our study because the study is all about how mindfulness does lead to changes in our brain. And those changes can only happen if neuroplasticity exists, which we know it does. Bilateral is a very simple thing. It just means, are you looking at the left side or the right side of something? And in this particular study, the focus did remain on the left hippocampus, which brings me to the next definition right here. You might have heard of the hippocampus. And if you want to know where it is in this little image, the hippocampus is somewhere around here. Sorry, let me just use a different color. So the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory, it's responsible for learning, for emotional regulation to a certain extent as well. But generally, the hippocampus is very strongly associated with our long-term memory. And hence, it's also related to learning. The hippocampus is somewhere around here. 
Whereas the insula, which is another piece of the brain or structure of the brain that was identified in previous research as being quite, being quite responsive in terms of growth to mindfulness, the insula will pop up later. It's also a structure in the brain. So the PCC or the posterior singular cortex is also a brain structure. Now this, the PCC itself is somewhere around here. And this, by the way, you can think of this as a left side view of the brain when we're talking about bilateral views or two sided. So this is a left view. And here you have your PCC or the posterior singular cortex. And this is a responsible for things like mind wandering or daydreaming. And hence, it's also related to our ability to stay present in the moment or be aware of how our body exists in a particular surrounding or a particular area. And then you have your TPJ, which is your temporoparietal junction. Now, the temporoparietal junction is very close to the PCC and it's actually somewhere around here. Temporoparietal junction, somewhere around here. And the TPJ is responsible for things like language processing, understanding how other people are thinking, what their beliefs are, what their intentions are. If you've been paying attention to previous lessons, then this is your theory of mind. And then lastly, of course, you have your cerebellum, which is basically right here. The cerebellum is responsible for balance for movement but it's and hence motor functioning motor is actually movement but it's also responsible for our mental imagery or the kinds of like things we can picture our imaginations um, so the cerebellum is another really important part of putting us together as functioning human beings who are conscious of our environment and can be can typically interact with other people and the stimuli in our environment as functional organisms. So that's a little bit of an overview of the key terms that appear in this study. And don't worry if you get confused at this point, because as we move through this series of lessons, a lot of these terms will come up again and again, and I will be referring to them to give you more clarity over and over again till you can possibly remember them. But for your purposes, just remember the, the PCC, the TPJ, and the cerebellum will emerge as most essential in this particular research study. So now that we've covered the overview, let's move on to getting into what the background of this study was and what the psychology was that was being investigated.